theyeshiva.net. Page Yud Beis, in the middle of the second paragraph. Uh, we've been learning about two preparations that are necessary and vital in order to absorb a new awareness. It's called two hafshatas. Two hafshatas means two, pros- two stages in the process of stripping oneself from the old to absorb the new. And he says, to understand them, you always have to look at the absence, what's missing when they don't have them. So the first idea was that a person can really uh, empty his mind or heart from previous thoughts, paradigms, ideas, and carve out an empty vessel, which is not empty in the sense that it's devoid of everything, but it's open. It's really open, not blocked and in. Uh, no interference of the static of the previous the previous noises. Now this exercise in and of itself is extremely potent, powerful, because it's the static which interferes so much to the new. And static doesn't here necessarily mean that it feels like static. Static is just that, you know, instinctively, this is how I approach things. This is how I deal with things. And sometimes a person, by the way, can live their whole life without ever noticing it. It's just the way it is. Like we don't even think we have control over it. It just happens. Like what am I supposed to do? Not be me? But really it's not you. It's not me. It's just I learned that method to survive. And uh, fortunate is the person who can identify these things. Because that's... The machine, yeah, it's a, we all try to survive, we all try to survive, yeah. And, you know, the animal in us wants to survive, the puppy wants to survive with a little elephant or the little rat or the little, whatever your nefesh of Bahamas looks like. Sometimes it's a little elephant, a little rat, a little cheetah, a little lioness. You know, some of them are cute also. Some puppies are very cute. It's not necessarily always a... Some of them are monsters. I wouldn't get in their way. You know, you have to know what Vasara Baheim and Mahandal. Huh? Yeah. So uh, some some are chimpanzees, gorillas. Some are ants, little ants, also trying to survive. And very sophisticated, by the way. Animals are uh, pretty brilliant. I wouldn't call them sophisticated, but brilliant. Genetically brilliant. So it's uh, it just becomes, this is how I operate. This is my mechanism. And I don't even know that I have control. Of course, this is how I respond. And But here we're teaching that, no, a lot of this is really when you learn who you are, there are choices we make. And a person can also really open himself or herself up for newness. But there's one condition, I have to be a clay reka, an empty vessel. And an empty vessel means that I open myself up to a new flow of energy, a new flow of water. Now, this doesn't mean that a person becomes an empty vessel, like we say, a pusta keli, which means there's nothing inside. That's in the negative sense. You know, you're a pusta keli, just an empty person. Here, it's an, an emptiness, which means an openness to infinity. So it's a completely different type of uh, reikon. There's reikon that you're just empty, you know. In, in Yiddish, it's a pustun vist. It's just empty, devoid of everything. Here, it's the emptiness in the most positive sense that I uh, don't allow any static on any level, physical, psychological, emotional, even spiritual or intellectual, to be able to obstruct that flow. So that's number one. But he said there's also number two. Number two is the language of, uh, of Kabbalah, that he becomes an akuda tachas hayesoid, which means, as he puts it here, that he becomes close. He brings himself very close to the mentor to... Hear the words. This is in the positive. Not emptying yourself out, but after that is now the attentiveness. There is what not and there's what yes. Right? There's going away from the old, but now there is tuning into the new. Whereas the expression of the Gemara, which I looked as a Maseches Chagig in the beginning of Gimel, I say, Tune in, make your ear like a, uh, a receptor, a receiver to absorb, to understand it, 
He says, let's look at the ab ab absence. The absence of number one is that there may be a person who listens and listens to everything and even listens to words or letters or paragraphs that he may not comprehend and understand. But he's not really ready to go away from the old. So everything that he or she comprehends will always be according to my ancient paradigms. And what we spoke yesterday, there's learning Torah like an older person and learning Torah as a child and no difference about your age. It's just an entire approach of how clean the slate is, how really, really clean the slate is. That's number one. Now we come, and that, when that's missing, it becomes very obvious. The person will grasp, the person will be enriched, the person will, be comp will comprehend, but always in a very limited way based on how much I'm ready, based on my old filing cabinets and what fits in goes, whatever doesn't fit in, I don't even relate to. And even that which, uh, and even that which I do relate to is on my terms. There is something else now. We come now to stage two. Uh, we're holding the line, Hakoidmim. It's Mamash, the middle of the page, Yud Beis. The line is Hakoidmim, middle of the second paragraph of the page. V'yesh mi shemafshet es on the other hand, you may have a student who is mafshet himself very much, which means he does strip himself from the old, what he calls the old yediyos, the old haskalos, the old paradigms. Umaniach, he puts away, aside, umesalak yediyos of hakaidma, and puts away his previous yediyos, his previous knowledge, so that he could really, really open himself up. Aval but he doesn't have the second discipline. He may have humility in the sense that he's really very open. Like a child, many ways, has it. A child, the reason they remember so much, people remember what happened, what, you know, sometimes you hear from your child something you said three years later. Like, how do you remember that? Because children actually remember. They remember, uh, they don't even know how much they remember. Because it's really a very clean slate, right? Like the Mishnah says, Dioik suva. Al Niyar Chadash, it's fresh paper. Like it says in Perkyovis, we spoke about yesterday, Elisha ben Avuya says, that's what a child is. The brain is so fertile, so ready to absorb. So a person may have that. Some people, they're just, there's a certain openness. But the attentiveness lacks. What lacks is, what's lacking now is the second step. And that is, The effort to really be attentive to become a conduit for everything that he won't do. He'll receive things that come in easy. You know what he understands. Things that come out of the mouth of his Rebbe, his master, and he doesn't have any understanding. He will not absorb them. In other words, he may have the ability to be completely open. I'm not interfering with my static, with my paradigms. I'm a receptacle. But the discipline, the attentiveness, the commitment, the positive dedication to really be uh, completely attuned to every word, to every nuance, whether I understand it or I don't understand it. Because if it's only what I can understand, meaning that which goes in right now into this open vessel, it's also going to be limited. I may be learning very new things, but it's limited to that which doesn't require Again, a different type of mysterious nefesh, a different type of commitment, which is really, really challenging myself to things that don't come easy, things that are completely new, things that right now just fly right over my head. And from all practical purposes, it seems to me like a waste of time. It's boring, it's irrelevant, it's inconsequential, it's incomprehensible. This too will not allow a student to really transform himself. So both components, when they're lacking, each one has its own uniqueness. One is the ability to be able to go away to the old, of the old, you know, lech lecha, me'artzecha, me'meladetcha, me'beis avicha, so to speak. You know, shichichi amech obeis avich, as the expression in Tehillim. And then there is tuning in, really tuning in, asay aznacha kafrecheses, where my ear has become truly receptacle of the new. And one without the other will be missing something very substantial. The second uh, sara of not being willing to listen and decollate things that he simply has no interest or understanding of could really come from two different uh, dysfunctions. 
either he doesn't have confidence in the Rebbe, that he's going to be able to really make it understand, present something appealing and understandable, or he doesn't have confidence in himself that he'll be able to reach the Rebbe. Right. He doesn't speak about which one. Right. Right. I don't think actually more than the Rebbe. That's what I thought also, that it sounded to me more like no, well, listen, if you're talking about a teacher who has proven himself to say nothing, then, uh, you know, <laughs> we're not talking about that. Like, this is, this, is all, this, this is all predicated on a foundation of deep trust. You know, we share that. Without that, then the whole process is, uh, becomes a mockery and an exercise in... Uh, uh, Futility and uh, even masochism, uh, self-torture. It happens. These things happen. In other words, the, te the teacher is delusional. The student is delusional. The student would like to have such a teacher. The teacher would have liked to have been. But it's like it's not a real, it's not an authentic thing. There has to be, you know, what to deliver. There's, there's, there's really something being delivered, both in terms of the subject and in terms of the person. And then the student can... <laughs> challenge himself but you want to challenge yourself if you empty your vessel for somebody to fill it with even worse trash at some point you, you stop emptying your vessel in other words the 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 emptiness the openness must be rewarded with something that's worth it because if not it becomes extremely discouraging and even worse as i told you when a mashpia doesn't have a makabal it's painful but when a makabal doesn't have a mashpia it's more than painful. It's very painful. Right. That's exactly the point. But the point is not to shut down. You're right. Sometimes t things take time. A lot. They always take time. A lot of time. Yeah, you have to hear it again and again and again. And then one day, one moment, boom, something, a little light shines in. That's true. But that's what attentiveness means. Attentiveness means I'm not, I'm not running away. I stick. I stay here. No, no, tuning in, tuning in. Ain't a makabal. He's, he's ready to be makabal. He's ready to be open to it. He may not grasp it. This is understood by anybody with experience. <laughs> anybody who is a bal nisayan, meaning he has nisayan, he has experience, understands this. And the explanation in both of the elements Number one and number two is very lengthy. But this is the point, and whoever has experience with this understands both of these elements very well. But what's the summation of this whole uh, long, lengthy explanation which he's not getting into? The summation is this. It's these preparations in the student which is This is what triggers most, what arouses most the tainugapnimi, the innermost delight and pleasure in the mentor to give and to give everything. Remember, we're dealing here with a new insight that is completely from a different realm that the mashpia went into in order to grasp, but the student remains bereft, remains forlorn. He could see on the face of the mentor at some point that there is a new glow, there is nihiru da'anpin, but he himself doesn't grasp it. Now comes the stage where we want the, the teacher wants to give it to him, but it needs a hachana, it needs a preparation. These are the two preparations from the student, and both of them trigger, they arouse the deep, deep tainug, the pleasure, the delight in the mentor to give, to communicate, and to give everything. And this is the tainug apnimi. Ki gam hu and now he goes through the same stages. Because in order to really communicate, he also has to go through these two stages. In addition to him being a student, being a real teacher, he goes through this. Number one, he suspends himself and puts himself aside for the sake of the recipient, for the sake of the student. That's number one. Similar to the preparation, number one of the makabal, Hanachas Satsmusay. The teacher also does anachas atzmusay. Why? Because remember, there's still going to be have to be a long tzimtzum, a big tzimtzum. 
to be able to get from the Yud to the He, to the Vav and the He, that we spoke before about the Klal and the Prat, the Klal and the Prat, in order to, for him to grasp it, now he has to go through a whole process in order to bring it down. And for this, he must really suspend himself for the sake of the student. And here we right away, we see, it's not a process that happens in the student alone. The same exact process must be reciprocated by the teacher. If he's not ready to suspend himself, so then something is off here. What's the greatest tainug? What triggers that deepest desire to give on that level? When the student completely puts aside everything and opens himself up to this so the teacher can't refuse it. It's, it's almost impossible to refuse because watching that openness, that readiness, that empty vessel, it's impossible for the mashpia to refuse that. And now what he does, exactly the same thing. He forgets himself. He renounces himself for the sake of the student, just like the student renounced himself for the sake of the truth that comes from the teacher. So that process triggers a similar process from the givers, like back to kamayim ha'ponem l'ponem, kein lev ha'adam ala'adam. The student renounced all of his old paradigms in order to receive the new. What that does is, in the mashpia, it brings out, it brings forth a deep tainug, a tainug hapnimi, very deep delight and a very deep pleasure to do what? To do exactly the same thing. To renounce his own identity and his own focus on his own growth to be able to tune into the world of the student. Va'acherkach. Now comes step two. There is going away from himself, renouncing his own, yeah, what we call his own steiging, so to speak. There's a beautiful word from the Ponem Yofis. The Ponem Yofis was a colleague of the Balatanya. His name was, um, he's known as the Bal Hafla. Hafla, it's Harav Pinchas Levi Ish Horowitz. He was one of the Goinim of his generation. He was the Rav of Frankfurt, Frankfurt in Germany. I mean, Avbezdin, he was one of the Goinim of the generation. He wrote a sefer called Hafla on Meseches Ksuvas and the Hamakna Meseches Kedushin, which are still uh, very yeshivish as far they're learned in all the yeshivas. He also wrote a sefer on Chumash called Ponem Yafas. He was a student of the Magad of Mizrich. And uh, so he has a sefer Ponem Yafas. He says, that, I think he writes it in the introduction, that the Gemara says in Meseches Chagiga, on the Pasuk Malachi says, if your teacher is like an angel, you should learn Torah from him. If he's not like an angel, you shouldn't learn Torah from him. <laughs> so what does this mean? <laughs> so everybody's looking for Malach, and we're going to find the Malach. What does it mean? So the Pandem Yafas gives a fascinating explanation. He says the difference between a Malach and a Neshama, it says a Malach is called an Oymed. He stands in one place. A neshama is called a mahalach. He's always moving. Pasuk says in Scharyev, in Asati lecha mahalchem bein ha'oim de ma'ela. I'm going to give you the ability to move between all those who stand. Because a malach more or less has his own orbit. You know, it's like the, the moon. The moon orbits. It's, it's, it's a complicated orbit, but it's predictable. It orbits. A malach, spiritually, it has its orbit. It's, you know, spiritually, genetically coded to move this way, it grows, it grows, but the growth is always incremental and relative to yesterday. On a Shema, a soul down here in this world, because of the uniqueness of our world, there is quantum leaps, transformation, the ability to really move away from the old, that's a, a soul, not an angel. So he says, Im harav If the Rav is like a Malach, then you should learn from him. Why? He says, a lot of teachers, <laughs> they... They want to teach. They want to express themselves. So if you already learned something and you know it well, you don't want to teach that again because you want to express, you want to, you, want to, you want to feel engaged. So therefore they have to grow and grow and grow and grow. And they have to give a shear that is, is unique and novel for the teacher that he should feel accomplished. What's the problem? The problem is that the student is not holding there. So therefore he's not really teaching him. He's teaching himself. At the end, he feels good that he presented such a, th such a great idea, but it doesn't go into anybody. It's not suitable to the keli of the student. He says, make sure your rav is like a malach. He's an oimed. <laughs> he, he, he renounces the need to be a mahalach in order to be an oimed. Sometimes you have, you can have in a yeshiva, you can have a rosh yeshiva, 
and he has brilliant, brilliant ideas, and he needs a platform. So it happens to be a room full of students. So they become the carbonus for, uh, for his brilliance. Now, it may be Taka brilliant, but a teacher, he's not. He's not a teacher. Why? Because they completely don't need that. Not shaykh to them. They're going to go away with nothing. They're not ready for it. So rather, you have to be an oimid. An oimid, that's the idea. He, he puts himself aside completely for the sake of the makabal. But then there's step two. That's only going away from the old. Now there's going stage two. The stage two in the student becomes stage two in the teacher. He gets close to the student. And he must measure him. He must estimate him. If you remember the letter Vav and the letter He, right? He has to measure him generally and measure him specifically in a differentiated way. Vis-a-vis -vis the idea that he wants to share. You have to know your student bichlal and you have to know bifrat. Just like with yourself. You always have to have the big picture. And then you have to be able to differentiate. Azra v'ayisapra. We learned before from Eiv. Chachma bina. Ra v'ayisapra. There's the big picture and there is the details. If you don't have the big picture, if you don't know really what you want to convey, you're missing something. But if you only have the big picture, you don't have the pratim, the structure, it's also not going to work. Sometimes people prepare, they have the big picture, they see the forest, but they don't have the pratim, right? So therefore, ultimately, it can't really be communicated effectively. On the other hand, sometimes people have all the details, but there's no big picture. There's no forest, there's only one tree, another tree, another tree. But the same thing has to happen vis-a-vis -vis the student. I have to understand Bichlal and Bifrat. I have to measure him from a place of Klal and also measure him from a place of Prat. How, how can the teacher know that the student is not going to be it's it 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 it's it's a very it's it's not mamish like the recipient in that sense, but it is because he really has to completely suspend his way of thinking about it and tune in to how he could communicate it to the student from experience and really from from tuning into the student's world. Right now, he's, 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 he's not forgetting now the token of his shear. Well, not, yeah. yeah. How he should relate to the piece, and putting aside all his previous preconceived notions of how he can communicate. To he has to put aside all his preconceived notions of how he could communicate and also put aside the natural urge of uh, continuing to relate to the idea from his perspective. Teaching at him rather than teaching to it. Huh? Teaching at him yeah. Umemela, umemela, and you know, and uh, like always, these are mashalim, but they relate to so many different situations. You want to communicate to your child, you want to communicate to your spouse, you want to communicate even to an employee or a friend, right? So sometimes we're tempted just to say what's on our minds. The person may be completely not ready to hear these words. They may not understand them, they may uh, misconstrue them. They may misinterpret them. So it really requires a very big symptom to be able to tune in to who you are, where you are, and how I can touch you today, rather than just express myself and say, oh, I expressed myself. <laughs> I expressed myself to myself, not to anybody else. Umemele nasala makabal tainu nifla. And when the student finally receives this, there's now a whole new tainug, a whole new delight, wondrous and far greater than what he received earlier, even in the beginning. Before anything happened, there was no drama, there was no departure, there was no ascent, there was no istalkus amoichen. But now what he's receiving is something so powerful, 
so new that even for the mentor, it's a complete revolution. So for sure for the student. So this process allows him to really experience a tainug and a relationship on a completely different level, which he could have not anticipated before, and he could have never experienced if this whole entire process would have not happened. He would have remained in the previous level of awareness, which was nice and lovely, perhaps, and there was a lot of tainug, but it's only this istalkos hamoichen, which comes as a result of new moichen being developed, which results in the absence of, which results in the Talmud feeling that very powerful moment of loss, which results in the fact that the teacher, which comes from the fact that the teacher had to ascend in order to experience the new, as explained at length on all three levels, which continues in a sense of solace and comfort that something good is happening, a new idea emerged, a new idea is fermenting and becoming ripe, which inspires and creates a yearning in the student for the new on both levels of hafshata that we explained, which triggers the tainug in the mashpia, which ultimately allows a whole new level of communication. And that relationship doesn't only go back to where it was, but now there is ultimately a new revelation that was unprecedented in the entire communication beforehand. From here we come back all the way to our discussion what happened between Moshe and Hashem by the first exile of the Jewish people. Moshe, who understands that everything works with Midas Hadin. That's how the system works. Midas Hadin. Midas Hadin means quit per quo, you do, and there are consequences. And he learned it from Sefer Bereshus. Bereshus operates Midas Hadin. Bereshus bara elekim. What did you do to deserve this? What did you do to trigger this consequence? How bad have you been? Who did you murder? Who did you destroy? Who, when did you become corrupt? When did you kill your grandmother? Let's find out. So we could see the reason for the consequence. Shmois doesn't have that. The Jews are in exile with no, no uh, there's no context, no sins. That was the struggle that we spoke about. And he wanted to understand Shairi Shadin and Shura Sadin. Shairi Shadin means what? The root for the din. Why? Shura Sadin means the system. System is the longer you are serving your punishment, the easier it becomes. At the end, it's easy. At the end, you're in a halfway house. That should have been the system in Gaulus also. It's already at the end. It should become the easiest. Not the exact opposite happens. Something is off. Something is strange. On his first question, and then he continues the other question, that when I came to Pari, it became worse, not better. Redemption starts, it becomes worse. She so says, Ata Tira, now, Ata Dafk, Meacha Shekais Nepach Ligamri, Achai is a Leki Boifen Shedvar Havaya Shabasorama Modus Ena Ma Idem Klalamata. Since now, the godly energy in the world has been transformed to the point that the divine energy known as the ten utterances which sustain creation are completely not manifest and revealed to the point to the point that Parai and his henchmen can completely deny the reality of godliness for the first time Parai says, Al Yishu Bedivre Sheker. All Moshe is doing is uttering lies. What was Moshe saying? There's a God who wants us redeemed. That ability to be able to deny a lakus completely. On one level, it's the worst moment of Golos. It's the worst. So this is the moment the Shia got disconnected. Exactly. This is the moment the Rebbe is gone. You look, where is he? Where is my. I mean, he's gone. He's not here. Come back. I'm not here. I don't know you. I don't care about you. There's complete detachment from an external perception. 
This is the moment that the shear got completely interrupted. There's not even an external communication. There's not even a gesture. The relationship seems completely dead. And there's no interest anymore. There's no passion. There's no presence. It's like, where is God? Look, search. And Parai emerges. And Parai now says, Al Yishu Bedivre Sheker. It's lies. As he said, the old Parai told Yosef, We'll see that later. But here there's a complete denial of, of, of godliness. So on one level, Moshe is so disturbed. You send me for redemption only to make a mockery. You don't want to redeem, don't redeem. You say, now we're going, I, I've heard the pain. Go, go, go. I go, and what happens? It gets worse. And the Jews are looking at me and saying, what are you doing? At least we survived as slaves. Tortured, but survived. And what you're doing is just causing the complete murder and annihilation. So Moshe comes to Hashem and says, May us bossy el pare le dabe bishmecha. Hey, Ralama zeva hatzel lo yitzalta samecha. It gets worse. Pare, Pare said that the Jews are dreaming of redemption because they're not working hard enough. They're too lazy. Nirpim atim nirpim. You're lazy, good for nothings. They're only working 18 hours a day in the field. That's too little. When you're lazy, you find God as an excuse. He says, put more, increase the burden of labor on them. Now they have to collect the straw on their own and yet do the same quota, prepare and complete the same quota of bricks every day. And they're beaten and they're hit. And he says, and if they work hard enough, they won't, al uh, they won't turn to falsehoods to false hopes, right? Religion is the opium of the Egyptian Jews. They need, they have all this, you know, they're leaning on, on, on straw. <laughs> no, the Jews are not being punished, that's his point. Moshe looks at this moment and he says, you started the process of redemption and it went backwards. It went backwards. What are you doing? One question is, Bechlal, why there's Golos and the whole system of Golos? Another question is, and why when you're already finishing the Golos, it gets worse? So he says, this is the moment, this is the moment, listen to these words. The Asara is Shia number one. Asaris Adibris, that's the real Shia. The Asara Mamaris is good stuff. Asara Mamaris is all science, all physics, all cosmology, all astronomy, all geology. And that's just the first few steps. Huh? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. All biology. All the, all, everything in this world. Asara Mamaris Nivra Ailam. And after five and a half thousand years, we still have not scratched the surface of what is contained in a single cell, what is contained in a single atom. In one, one atom, I'm not talking about one atom, what is contained. That's all Asara Mamoris. Asara Mamoris Nivra Oilam. That's a shear. The world is a shear. And it's a, it's, it's a pretty deep shear. <laughs> if you ask me, it's a pretty deep shear. Vaharaya, 6,000 years later, humans have researched, so we know, we know a lot of stuff. And we built bridges, and we built airplanes, and we built internet, and we built computers, and we landed on the moon 50 years ago, and we split the atom, right? But it's not Asaris Hadibris. There's Asar Mamaris, Asaris Hadibris. Asar Mamaris are the 10 sayings that created the world. Asaris Hadibris is what happens at Sinai, on Noichi Hashem so Asar Mamaris is the first shear. So he says the moment the Asar Mamaris are concealed completely. What's Asar Mamaris? Asar Mamaris is the presence of the Rebbeinu Shalom in the world. That there is an author, there's somebody who's speaking it into existence. The Mishnah says in Pirkei Yavis, Kol ha'oymer davar b'shem oymerai, mevi gu'ula la'olam. When you say something in the name of the one who said it, you bring redemption to the world. Right? Shenemar Vatoimer Esther Lamelech B'Shem Mardecha. 
What is the meaning of this? So if I quote somebody, I bring redemption to the world. And if I don't quote you, I plagiarize. <laughs> That's it. No ge'ula la'ila. What's the meaning of this? So there's different interpretations. One interpretation is, I heard this from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Kala oimer davar b'shem oimrai. A person who says everything b'shem oimrai. You identify the one who's saying it into existence. Hu amar vayehi bidvar Hashem shemayim nasu. Your oimer davar, you look at everything and you trace it back. What's the difference of plagiarism and not? It means I steal your material and it becomes mine suddenly, yeah? And I print a book with my name and it's half is stolen from you. What's Oymer Dabar B'Shem Oymre? I trace it back to the one who said it. Everything in the world, every Dabar, there's an Oymre, there's somebody who's saying it, who's bringing it into existence. When you identify and everything you say in the name of the one who brings it into existence, may vi gu'ula la You redeem the world. Oylam comes from the word Helam. You emancipate the world from a state of concealment. So you take a cup of coffee, a cup of wine, and say, Baruch atah Hashem alakeinu melech ha'olam, shahakol niya bidvaroi. Everything came into existence through his word. That's a oimer dava b'shem ha'emra. And what happens? The whole world is redeemed. This is the process of asara ma'amoros. Suddenly there's a state where asara ma'amoros are completely concealed. The shear is stopped. There's no communication. There's no revelation. The student is holding on to something. And Pari says, there's nothing. I don't know God. I'm not interested. And it becomes even worse. He calls it a lie. So he says, what's Pshat? This means the new level of awareness. The higher sheer already emerged in the world. This is what we called Moich in the Attic. Remember, when does the first Shear go dead? When? When? When, there's a, when? when the new light was born. Before the new light was born, everything looks beautiful. A new light was born, a higher level of Moich. And what happens? There's his Stalkus, he goes up. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Zalach ois ki anoichi, yeah. Yeah, beautiful diuk. This is the ois. Now, this doesn't mean that it's not painful. Don't confuse the two. This doesn't mean it's not painful. It's painful. Because there's a loss. There's a real loss here. But it means it's painful, but it's not hopeless. It's not because... You're living in a world where you're just thrown to the dumps, where you're left hanging dry. It may feel that way. This is where trust comes in, right? You have to know who your teacher is. <laughs> if you can really suspect that one day he's in a bad mood, <laughs> that's what he felt like. In Midas Hadin, he's right. In Judaism, as Midas Hadin, I did right, I get reward. I did bad, I get punishment. It's a very black and white system. And we know that there are still a lot of, um, there are still, you know, many of our holy brothers and sisters who only know about that system of Judaism. It's very black and white. You know, something happened, what did you do bad, you know? <laughs> if things are going good, oh my God, what's going to happen next week? It's, it's a very clear system. Midas Hadin. You do good, you good, bad, bad. And it's very clear. Somebody is suffering, let's find out what he sinned. Why is sin? Huh? You fashbish by myself, yeah. The Ramam and Hilchas Tainius, not to say Mikra Nikra. Yeah. A machloikus in Gemara, if yes, she's surim below, like the Gemara in Baba Bas, and you surim below Yavin. In Brachas, there's a whole argument. Is there something called Yisurim Shal Ava? Is it always pre 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 preceded by sin? It's a huge, huge argument. And ultimately, it's not resolved. <laughs> of course, it's not resolved. But when you look at the Sefer Eiv, right, you see a whole other dimension over there. Eiv says, I'm innocent. His friends say, It's impossible. You're a criminal. 
and they're arguing for chapters. He says, I'm innocent, I'll take God to court. At the end, you would think God will side with the friends. They were the ones who said, you're the bad guy, Hashem is good, just confess your sins. And Eve said, I did nothing wrong. At the end, Hashem says, his friends need atonement. His friends need atonement. It's, it's a very sensitive issue. So what is the Rebbeinu Shalom telling Moshe Rabbeinu here? Ooh, the Asarim Amoris are concealed. There's no trace of them in the world. This shear is interrupted. Good things are happening. That means the Asaris Hadibris were born. The new identity, the new reality of Asaris Hadibris emerged. And because they emerged, that's what caused the histalkos of the old Moichen the departure, the ascent, the interruption, which for the student, the lifeline just got cut. Which in reality translates into the intensity of Golos Mitzrayim. <laughs> That's the point. A new arm person in the of the Sunday in Sadiq Yotzim and all along until even the shower comes in. Yeah. Yeah. V'zarech Hashem ish abo Hashem ish. The sun sets for a new sun to emerge. Dar ha'elech v'dar ba. And that's the paradox of Tisha B'av. That's what I explained that we spoke about Friday. That when you look at Tisha B'av, you see this paradox in Judaism that is a very, very strange paradox. It's the worst of times and it's the best of times. So it's very hard to put your hand around it. So people give all types of explanations. You'll hear all these types of shiurim, you know. And they're like, you know, once God is finished punishing, good things will happen. Whatever, all these types of explanations doesn't hit the core. It's not the Nakuda. Because it's too paradoxical. The destruction happens, Mashiach is born. Why should Mashiach should be born the next day? <laughs> This is about our great national tragedy, Tisha B'Av. In the great personal tragedies that befall a person, is this, are we to understand that this message is true in everyone's personal tragedy? <laughs> After they deal with the Chitsonis, we deal with Chitsonis of Tisha B'Av before we think about the Pneumius of Tisha B'Av. So after someone deals with the Avelis and the pain, that they're supposed to potentially emerge an awareness that in this but, you know, Baha Shemesh, there's also a Zarah Hashemesh, that there are new Mochim that have somehow, but is this a lesson applicable to one's daily life? Rip Shloyma says, absolutely. <laughs> Rip Shloyma says, absolutely. <laughs> and Bechah Halachik Rip Shloyma in this sugya. I don't understand. So it's like a seed is planted. Listen, it's, it's very sensitive. Yes. It's not something that you, you know, just preach lightheadedly. Oh, it's great stuff, man. It's like looking at this student, right? The shear is obviously a model. It's a metaphor. You know, most of us don't take shiurim so seriously that... Uh, so he stopped talking. Great. So recess is earlier, you know. In most cases, you know, the Rebbe spaced out. Wonderful. You know, let's light the firebombs and go for lunch. Let's go to the gym, right? It would actually be a very exciting moment if the teacher gets lost in his new ideas. I just want to bring that out. Present company, of course, exclude it. But it's a very serious marshal because we're talking about a relationship that is very, very deep. Well, that's what a marshal is. It seems, well, what I'm saying, it seems to be this place because the Pahidans in Israel were not appearing in the past. They were just the exact opposite. They were so toxic that uh, their belief system in their Rebbe, in Moshe, or in God, it seems to me was, was, was truncated to the point where you had it on one side from the perspective of the apple of the teacher, but not on the other side from the Kabbalah. So how is that fair? Mm. No, that's not a fair analogy, right? But, but you... Uh, because the truth is, it seemed that way also. But, you know, Moshe said, They're not going to believe me. They're not interested. And he became a leper because of it. He became, he became a Mitzayra. And the Gemara says, Hashem said in Sha Shabbos Tzavdek Zayin, Maminim bnei maminim. You don't know them. You have to trust them. 
and you're speaking gossip about them, obviously relative to the level of Moshe. Because Moshe was looking at tremendous toxicity, and they were in, the, in a very difficult place. And also, in Parshas Vaschanon, the term that he uses for Egypt is Kur HaBarzal. You know what Kur HaBarzal is? Kur HaBarzal is the... The iron furnace, there's the word for it. Huh? The crucible. The crucible, very good. Where you refine the barzel. It's very hot. Which means that the Jewish... There's a beautiful Torah from Rabbi Shimshon Astrapolar on this. It's a moira de Torah. Say good. Say good. And I imagine if I would have to invent that Torah, I would really have to go. I'm just trying to remember what I read. <laughs> but if I would have to invent that Torah, I would have to take a go. <laughs> I have to recall the details. The point is that the, you know, sometimes we become ready for different things in life through two ways. One consciously, like the student you're talking about, and sometimes there's even a deeper way, and that is experiences of life, life's experiences. And that sometimes prepares people in a much deeper way, you know? It's the premise that the person has to be an empty vessel. You have to suspend your judgment. You have to put your experience aside. So are you having to have a both Right, but I think we have all seen people, and maybe ourselves even, that certain life's experience just uh, bring you to a place where you become an open vessel. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it, it, he calls it a crucible. In a crucible, the iron is just, it loses its whole... Uh... No, but there's a lack of contribution. <laughs> Right, I understood you. You know, sometimes you meet people and they live, uh, I don't mean to talk about addiction again, but uh, <laughs> it's not addiction, it'll be marriage, but we'll stick to addiction for now. You have a person, they're wrapped in so many lies. I think Winston Churchill once said about the Soviet Union, he said about the Soviet Union, it's, a, uh, it's an enigma wrapped in a riddle, right, encompassed by a puzzle that is all a lie or something. It was a great definition of the Soviet Union. You know, lie after lie after lie after lie, which is also a lie. <laughs> the lies are also lies. <laughs> it's so far from truth, right? Everything there was a lie. There was like not one statement that was ever true. Stalin is sick, Stalin died. I mean, the whole thing from beginning, because the whole thing was a lie. It, it thrived on lies, which is why it destroyed itself at some point. So you have people like that. You have people, you know, who, who are just that way. The lies are so deep, it's not even conscious anymore. That's really what happens with addiction. The, the law, everything is a lie, and more lies. You lie to yourself, to your wife. You just lie to everybody. And... Uh, the pain of that is just, uh, it's unbearable, which is why you have to lie so much. And there's no way of talking to the person. There's no way of communicating to the person because they're just lying. They can't even look at you. There's nobody here. There's nobody present. You know, that's the difference between somebody who's present and you can have a conversation and somebody who's not present. And sometimes the only tikkun is, the only tikkun is, and it's very painful, when they lose everything. They mamish lose everything. Now, sometimes they destroy everything and there's nothing left to lose because they're dead. But sometimes they lose everything. I, I, I once, uh, a fellow once came to see me. And, uh, and he shared with me the following. He grew, up in, uh, he grew up in Lakewood. Very nice family, a good family. 11 children. Uh, all of them are learning and, you know, they're supported by a rich grandfather or something. And uh, he's married himself with a bunch of kids. And he was in Kailal for many, many years. And he fell prey to addiction, gambling primarily. And this went on for a long time and he was hiding it and lost a lot of money and lost the money that was given to him. He said, what brings you here? 
and he said that uh, he was living a complete life of addiction and lies to everybody. And he said a few months ago, he came to see me, uh, it was uh, spring or beginning of summer. He said a few months ago, he was sitting in Atlantic City in the casino, gambling away the last pennies he had, drunk. And there's no clocks in the casinos, you know that? Because they don't want you to know time. They just want you to be there forever. And he said, somebody walked over to him and said, you know what time it is? He said, no. The guy said, it's six o'clock. He said, you know what day it is? He says, no. He says, it's Yom Kippur. And he said, I stopped. I said, six o'clock, six o'clock. That's Na'ila. Yom Kippur, six o'clock is Na'ila. And I'm here in Atlantic City. I said, wow, I reached a place in life that Yom Kippur by Na'ila, I'm gambling and drinking. I realized that I hit rack bottom. So he came, he came for help. Right. So what happens? What happens here is, in a very painful and paradoxical way, that kur habarzel, you know, that ability to look at your face and see the devil, woke him up to a whole new level of awareness. But it only came because he had to be shocked Mamasha shock treatment out of the old. So it happens on so many different levels that the Kurha Barzil, the crucible, where the person is carved out, becomes empty, not necessarily because of his work, but because of, in many ways, it may be the most beneficial moment in life when he has to face the truth and suddenly say goodbye to everything and come clean and confess everything. And that's very, very hard. And the ability to be like a child and say, I know nothing, everything was a lie, everything was a fabrication, everything was made up. To be able to say goodbye to all of that, it challenges him to become a clay raycon. And what looked like the worst moment often turns out to become the beginning of his redemption. So it's true on so many different stages, on so many different levels. So uh, the doctor said, is it true on a personal level? It's all true on a personal level. It's the whole point of this mime. It's not just the national. What's, what's true in the macro is true in the micro. But it's a very sensitive process. And one has to be very careful how it's presented, not only to others, even to yourself. Because this does not take away the pain of the experience of Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is painful and a personal Tisha B'Av is very painful. Nobody says, oh, Tisha B'Av, a new light came into the world. Let's eat. Let's dance. Why are we sitting on the floor saying Eicha? Why are we saying Kinnas? Why are we fasting? <laughs> what are you doing? The light of Mashiach was born. That's what it says. But everybody knows that that's cr uh, trespassing the boundaries of Halacha. There was a Jew who ate on Tisha B'Av publicly. It was the same Jew who changed the, the Nusach of the Brachas. Baruch Atah Hashem Alekeinu Melech HaOilam Matir Isurim Matir Isurim You know who this was? Shapsai Tzvi. He, ate, he was born on Tisha B'Av, by the way, which was part of the problem. Because he was born on Tisha B'Av, right? Where did he go wrong? We're learning. There's so many... Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. Where you go wrong is, right, when somebody, Chas V'Shalom, comes to a Shiva house and sits down and looks at the father, looks at the mother, and says, oh, great light was just born. Like, great. You're off. What are you off? And you have sources. We just learned the Hester, the New Oyer, and everything. You're not in touch with the human experience. You're completely detached from the human experience. This student, his lifeline was just cut. He's choking. He said, oh, it's great stuff. <laughs> You're ch I'm choking. I can't breathe. It's great stuff. But there was just a, a, a the, the, the line was cut. So you have to be very sensitive to that and very attuned to that. And that's part of the experience. It's part of the realness of it. And yet we say together with that, together with that, Tisha B'Av is a day of Chorban. We say within that itself, there's something happening. 
but there are stages of how it develops. So it's very true on a personal level as well. But one has to always have compassion on yourself and on others to the process and the pain of the experience. And that's the problem is that stages of redemption don't happen if person gets stuck. Of course. Of course. Of course. And it's never about judgment or, 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 or trying to convince or you know, pressure somebody. It's, it's a very organic process. It's about empowerment. It's about really helping yourself and, and, and your loved ones always understand that when one door closes, it's because another one opened. And one window was shut because a different window opened. It's not that all the doors were closed. A different door opened. And I may not be interested in that door. I want this door. <laughs> I want this door. I like this door. I like this exit. I like this end. I'm used to it. I like it. It's good for me. This is the place I want to walk. And I never asked for new doors. <laughs> I don't need new relationships. I don't need new awareness. I don't need a new depth. I don't need a new God. I like my old God. My old comfort zone God. So that's, that's a very understandable process. But now one has to make a choice. And the choice is really one of victimhood and deep despondency. And just look at life and say, I have been dealt a... Uh, what? A bad deal. Bad hand, as they say. A sour face. Or it's time to be able to uh, open myself up to a completely different reality. And on that note, I wish you all a very meaningful, empowering, wholesome, and authentic day. And Mazel Tov Reb Avram. Chasana today. I think this is what the Yaakov is asking about the time. Yeah. The phenomenon when they, when they, when they, when they got to the four previous Yom Sutter. Um, yeah, they all had a miss, 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 let's go back to work for them. They had a comfort level for working for time, but the same folks, it's not even a shepherd, but he honestly, so I don't know what, it might not be, I'd love to say, but there was a deep, deep, Vaye Ancho, Vaye Tzako. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a comfort zone. They kept saying, leave me alone. Let me go back to that comfort zone. But somewhere, they, 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 the truth is, it wasn't such a comfort zone. <laughs> no, but if you look, I remember the words from the Rebbe, they said there were four groups of people. Yeah. Nachzal and Mitzrayim. There's a word from the Chidush Harim, you know what he said. On the Chidush Harim, or maybe the Svasemes. Yeah, yeah, Chves. Vahitsesi eschem mitacha sivlois mitzrayim. What's sivlois? The world teaches, I'll take you out from the sevel, from the suffering. The word sivlois is like we have today a word savlanut. Lisbol. What's savlanut? Patience, tolerance. Vahitsesi eschem mitacha sivlois I'm going to take you out from a state in which you tolerate mitzrayim. The beginning of Geula is when you become intolerant of Mitzrayim. As long as you make peace with abuse, you become like you have a battered woman syndrome. You're not going anywhere. The moment you say, this is sick, this is dysfunction, this is a lie, I'm not living like this another day, now you can be redeemed. So in a way, the Golos has to be real Golos for there to be real Geula. If Golos is chatzi nice, there's no Geula, you make peace with it. That's what happens. What do you need more? What do you need more? Metachas sivlis. When you become intolerant, you say, this is sick. This is sick. I hate this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tolerate this another day. Now you could be redeemed. Now you could be liberated. You, you vomit. You have to vomit. You have to spit out the gullus. I met a, a fine Jews refused this. That's what yeah, yeah. They're a, disgusted by it. Yeah. If you're not disgusted by something, you'll stick with it. You'll make peace. It's always that way. I met a fine African American gentleman who tells me, man, I got 17 years clean. I said, wow, that's an accomplishment. How did you do it? 
said, I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? We don't, we don't want to, though, like, wait for a friendship so that we can have a revelation. No, no, no. We want to be going good. Yeah, yeah. That's how we will want the gula. We don't, we don't need any more, yeah. Jews already had enough. Uh, the, she, the Shia stopped. God's Shia was interrupted enough. <laughs> We're ready for the real shear. Yeah. Some, some of the guys in the shear, some of the guys, some of us have hit, hit very low places and had an aliyah from that. But we don't. But now we're maybe we're doing good, or, and we and we want more aliyah from a good place. That's true. That's true. Aliyah from a good place is what we want. Yeah, but in a, sometimes it's hard because you become co complacent. You're right, you're right. That's the tachlis. The Ula didn't come because you're not ready to go away from the world. It's very, it's very difficult. You're so entrenched in, in this, in this life. life. I can tell you. If you don't know what Gullus is, how could you know what Gullus is? If you don't know what Gullus is, how can you know what Gullus is? so comfortable in, in some times. Yeah, it's true. Metzesi asked him, Metachas Sivlois. If it's applicable to today's teachers, if you'll be such a teacher, it'll be applicable to today's teachers. <laughs> I think some of it is applicable to every teacher and every student. You know, what level is always degrees, but the, the, every, relationship. every relationship it's applicable to. I know that. <laughs> It's hard. Do you need a Talmud who really trusts the Rav and a Rav who's completely committed to the Talmud? It's a, it's a, it's a very rich relationship. Talmud Muvak. You know, he has skin in the game. Reb Hillel Zamaima. He was printed the last few years. It was in the library. The Rebbe once said over the Maimer, Bekitzer, in you know, Asicha. And then they printed it a few years ago. It's incredible mind map, huh? This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.